What's up, my friend? Welcome to the Finding Direction podcast. My name is Stu Massengill, and I'm here every single week to bring you a passionate guest or message dedicated to helping you find your purpose so that you can live a life full of passion, fulfillment, and happiness. From the bottom of my heart, thank you for hanging out with me, and let's dive in. What's up, my friend? Welcome back to another episode here on Finding Direction. This week, I'm sitting down with Dr. Stan Tatkin and a little bit about him. He is a therapist and he's also the developer of the psychobiological approach to couples therapy, aka PACT. Uh, He is a best-selling author of six best-selling books, uh, which include a few to name, Wired for Love, also his recent book, In Each Other's Care, uh, just to name a few. And he is also has one of the most popular TEDx talks on the internet with over 1.7 million views. Um, he is an expert on human behavior and relationships, and he travels all over the world, including his private practice in California, uh, helping people with things in the regards of relationships, dating, marriage, love, intimacy, and mental well being. Um, he has a wealth of of knowledge, also just a really incredible personality, which you'll hear about on the episode. And a few things that we dive into that you can expect today is what are some of the keys when it comes to starting in a relationship, right? When you're in that sort of dating space, we talk about the keys to creating a long lasting relationship. We talk about how even as you start to approach dating, uh, you actually there's drugs that come into play every single time. It's not something that you can ignore. So it's a really interesting thing that, and way that he sort of has studied relationships. And we talk about the importance of understanding attachment styles in relationships as well. So there's so much that we cover in this episode. Uh, if you are someone who wants more love in your life, or if you're in a relationship or looking for one, or one day hope to be in one, uh, I promise you this episode is going to give you some nuggets that can impact your life in a positive way. So without further ado, Let's dive in. Dr. Stan Totkin, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you, Stu. It's great meeting you. Yeah, good to meet you too. I'm excited for our conversation. And, you know, as we dive in, um, one of the big things we're going to talk about today is relationships, obviously. And I think an interesting part when you look at relationship is there's so many different uh, like phases of relationship, right? The You're meeting people, you're dating someone, you're committed in a long-term relationship. So we're going to try to look at a little bit of everything. And I thought where we would start um, is let's kind of go from the end slowly. Actually, let's start at the beginning. Let's say for our single listener, right? They're listening to this. They're going, ooh, relationships. I'm looking for the one. Um, What are a few... Like if you could give them three principles, three philosophies to say, hey, here's some things that would be extraordinarily helpful as you go find your you know, perfect mate, your person that could be that person that you've been longing for. Um, you've obviously done extensive research and, and so much work in this, but for someone who's maybe they're excited about it, maybe they're, you know, they've, they've been with people and they're kind of tired of it. Like, would you have any advice for someone that's kind of going through those early phases of getting the ball rolling? Well, that's a lot. I mean, there is a lot there to unpack. Um, I, so, uh, so there are a lot of things to to consider. People make the mistake of looking for the one, you know, my soulmate, uh, uh, mm. and that's generally a mistake. Generally, a mistake. It'll misguide the person who's doing that, because what you should actually do is make a list, write down which is kind of a, uh, an ongoing meditation of what the perfect relationship for me would be. What, what is Mm. the relationship I must have if I want to go forward, uh, in that relationship for, you know, an indeterminable amount of time, not the person and, and, uh, you know, start with safety and security. Um, do I want a relationship that is absolutely safe and secure? Maybe I don't, um, but put that down. Uh, and in in the area of safety and security, would it be we have each other's backs at all times, um, 
or you know we don't have to have each other's backs or uh, we protect yeah. each other in public and private notice how the sentence starts with we it's not i mm -hmm. or you imagine that you know this is you, this is somebody who's joining you and agrees yeah. with yeah. your ideas of what a relationship should be which is better than a than the person because people will disappoint all people are annoying irritating <laughs> pain in the ass all people are disappointing. Um, so, uh, so that is just the way it is. So rather than focus on the person, focus on uh, what your vision of, uh, of a perfect relationship is as best as you can in the area of safety and security, love, romance, sex, in the area of personal growth, in the area of creating things. Um, perhaps it is, you know, having a family, having children, whatever. Uh, but be very specific, always starting with, we do this, we, yeah. right, but no, nothing having to do with feelings. So don't put anything that has to do with feelings. We, we are happy. Uh, you can't legislate happiness. You can't legislate emotion. You can mm. legislate and measure uh, behaviors that lead to good feelings and keep you from bad feelings, right? So Interesting. do that. And make sure that whatever you're writing, we, blah, 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 is pithy. In other words, it's just one thing, and it would be easy enough for a five-year-old to understand. <laughs> Do that. And then start to be on the lookout as you are meeting and greeting people, because you're vetting them, um, for whether they seem to be in the, in the, you know, in the area right. of what you put down, because you're not going to be able to know for a while. And you can't really, you know, uh, poke at them because that's kind of weird and, and intrusive. But you're going to keep your ear out. You're going to watch for the signs because you're looking basically at, does this person want what you want? Um, does this person, yeah. uh, are they oriented morally um, in the way you, uh, uh, your system that you're thinking of, your culture that you're trying to create uh, agrees with? Um, and then when you, when you vet people, when you go out, I wrote a book on this called Wired for Dating. Um, people can refer to that. We call it Sherlocking. Right oh, there, for um, sure. Sherlocking, um, you're not wasting your time, yeah. even if you are going through people that you would never see again. You're not wasting your time honing your skills at picking up every little clue that you can you are watching this person, you are examining them without them feeling examined yet. For them, right. you're, just paying, you're just paying attention. But you start to really listen and watch how their face moves, arms move, uh, expressions, how their voice is, how they change uh, their voice, how they treat people around them. Um, you're collecting data and you're getting a sense of who you're with. That's a skill that will do you no matter where you are and and if you really understand what I'm talking about, there is no person who's boring. You may not want to go right. out with them again, but you didn't waste time, right? You didn't waste yeah. time because you're, you're practicing your, your human skills of reading people uh, carefully um, without looking like you're scrutinizing people because that's unpleasant. Yeah. And, and can you expand upon... I mean, one of the things, and again, I held up your book, Wired for Dating. It's a book, one of your books that I've read. I was, uh, a, a friend referred it to me, and um, it definitely had a big impact on my life. So first and foremost, thank you for, for oh, doing the work. You. That's nice. Yeah. And I'm and glad. one thing that you talk about in it is this, uh, and, and one of the things just part of your work that's so fascinating is you really look at like the neurobiology of what yeah. like what happens in our brain in our systems when we date when we love all these different things which are i think so different than so many people look at it and so fascinating like i mean you could do a a a full year master class on it i mean there's it's just so deep there's a lot to, but, there's a lot to say on how many levels we actually select mates but yeah yeah and, and so one of the things you talk about is that as we go throughout at least the initial stages of dating you are you are you're neurobiologically drugged and i was yeah. just wondering if you could expand upon that a little bit because it's very interesting so uh let's understand that nature uh is indifferent to us 
we have mm -hmm. emotions and we're motivated often by emotions. Um, nature doesn't care about that. Nature is using emotions to do its job, which is to procreate, which is to, conti to continue the species. And I'd say even more so um, uh, to mix up the gene pool, which is what we naturally did uh, before we were, uh, you know, uh, uh, thrusted together uh, in a civilization yeah. that had uh, certain uh, ideas about m morals, right? Um, but naturally, we would we would pair bond for about four years enough to raise a child and protect the child. Uh, that's because the attachment system is a biological mandate that glue that holds us together for just this reason. And then we either die, that was then, you know, we died early, or we would yeah. just leave yeah. and mix up the gene pool. Um, so uh, none of this is personal, but it's very personal to us. So we meet somebody and uh, we get excited. Um, there's a whole process that has to do with, uh, with approach and near vision. Uh, I won't get into that right now. Um, sound prosody. I won't get into that smell. Uh, that's at play. Also all these things that are happening and we start to produce endogenous, that means internal chemicals that blur our judgment, but basically, uh, make us hot and horny very focused and, <laughs> and interested and that that in itself is very exciting that we are riveted by this person and there um th there is uh, a an excitement that we all seek um because it feels wonderful because we're on dopamine we're on uh, mm -hmm. noradrenaline and adrenaline phenylethyl phenylethylamine um uh, oxytocin vasopressin all of these all of these exciting, engaging, rewarding endogenous drugs um, that really um, uh, can can overwhelm us and definitely uh, change our judgment. So I'll get to that in a moment. Therefore, we're, yeah. we're basically superheroes at that moment. We're unencumbered by memory. We are smitten by this other um, who we identify in some way as familiar. We... Um, we are projecting, because we don't know this person, but we're projecting yeah. our hopes and our best self in this person. All this stuff is happening. Well, that's going to go away. That's going to go away. It's going to subs uh, you know, subside uh, over time. And then we yeah. go back to our yeah. baseline, which right. may be disappointing, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, but it is what it is. So that's the first phase. It is, it is the, it's the jettison. It's like a rocket getting off the ground, right? And sometimes yeah. um, uh, that's it. Uh, mission aborted. Uh, that first, uh, that first uh, rocket part is all we're going to get, and we move on to somebody else. Fine. But as we progress in a relationship, other things start to happen. We idealize still. But also, we start to automate another person. So let me explain that. Um, yeah. We're energy-conserved animals, meaning that we do the least amount necessary by instruction of by nature so that we can uh, actually exist. Otherwise, we'd burn out very early if we were constantly using really heavy-duty uh, energy uh, expending areas of the brain and body. Um, we can't do that, so we relegate anything new to something that's now old doesn't matter what it is so you and i uh Stu, let's say you know in the beginning i want to know everything about you i want i want to i'm i'm just obsessed with you and yeah. and there's a neurochemical reason why i'm obsessed there's a lot there's a lack of serotonin uh and so i um uh that that phase is so cool and then my brain begins to get used to you and you're no longer as novel as you were because of repetition and i relegate you to automation into a kind of memory that's very cheap to run but also kind of folds into all memory that i've had with anybody going back to my birth um that i ever felt wonderful with or terrible with um and so life is easier with you because I'm not, I'm not expending as much energy with you, but I also begin to assume I know you, but I don't. I begin to make mistakes and errors by losing formalities and taking liberties, which I shouldn't. 
And I stop paying attention. I stop being present as much. And this will start to fade more and more if I don't understand what's happening. Right. Right. And then I look toward to uh, the outside for new novelty because the brain loves novelty. This happens to everybody. And so um, we have to guard against it by overriding it and and having periods we build in of, of presence and attention. Otherwise, we get bored of each other. We lose track of each other. Uh, we take uh, we we make assumptions that are false. All sorts of things start to happen. But that's the next phase. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then the phase of I remember and I remember things I don't like in my family. You kind of remind me of somebody. Oh, I think it's my mother. And uh, the way you hold your shoulders, the way you move, the way you talk, and I don't like it. So now we're aware. <laughs> That recognition factor is not just the cool stuff, but also the stuff I don't like, I don't like, I don't mm -hmm. want. That's another phase. Um, and so we do go through these developmental phases on the way to commitment. And, uh, and uh, we might think of all this as, a, as vetting, right? Uh, at any yeah. time I can say, ah, you know what? I didn't know this about you, no deal. And that's fair, right? That's fair. We can't, you know, we can't uh, judge what we don't know yet. So yeah. that's in a nutshell. There are more phases that we go through, right. but in a nutshell, right. that's the beginning. Party on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So interesting. It's I heard um a quote somewhere and it was something along the lines that like very similar to what you said. It's like you get to know a person, you date them a little bit, and then you think you know everything about them. But the reality is like you're continuing to grow as individuals year after year after year. So the person you're dating in five years is actually somewhat of a different person than you were dating five years before. And if you don't continue getting to know them and learning about them and still sort of having this like childlike curiosity about the other person, it's, it's your relationship's not going to grow in as positive a way as it could. Well, you're, and you're not going to, because, um, uh, in, in these kind of relationships, self and other are intertwined. Uh, if I like curiosity about you, I'm also not, uh, learning about me. Um, mm -hmm. They're intertwined. So people have to remember, we, we actually encode a picture of our, of our primary attachment figure. That's the most, that's the most important person to us. Our primary is, uh, is this is why these relationships are very difficult. The only relationship like the adult romantic pair bonding uh, situation is our earliest pair bonding attachment system with our originals the gods that brought us to being, um, <laughs> right? And, our, and so our parents. our parents, right. Or whoever yeah. they were. Um, right. And so, and so, uh, so th this is a, another complicating factor in love relationships. Um, but, uh, 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 so we're going to, uh, we're going to hold a picture. I'm going to hold a picture of your face maybe for a week or a month without ever looking really closely at it because I'm operating again with a memory, with a picture. I don't take time to look at your face to see what's changed. That in a nutshell is everything. Um, I don't, uh, I'm not in contact with you. We're not spending a lot of time together. Uh, therefore we're not influencing each other, uh, by proximity. We're not curious about each other. So we're, um, we're stumbling around and being incompetent at each other because we just don't, we just don't investigate. We just don't, we're not curious anymore. Right. Um, you don't feel understood. I don't feel understood. You don't feel seen. I don't feel seen. We start to get bored and we start to look elsewhere or we start to make too many misappraisals of each other, which leads to threat. So mm -hmm. it's a, it's, it's a real problem. Therefore, the reason I treat you as you are a stranger for life, I'm constantly trying to get to know, which is a lifelong endeavor. Uh, you're not family. Family is a whole other thing where I can get away with things I shouldn't and I take liberties I shouldn't and I have entitlements that are inappropriate mm -hmm. in an adult symmetrical relationship. These are things we can all fall into. So uh, so it keeps me in reality to realize I don't really know you, but I still want to get to know you. And, um, and that makes you interesting. So growing mm -hmm. up, is understanding that we we look for novelty in the ordinary. We don't keep seeking novelty and running like looking for a, a drug, right? Because uh, yeah. it never never ends. 
um, we commit. I'm going to commit to you because I can and because it allows me to to uh, to learn you well, right. which makes right. which forces me to learn myself well. I can't do one without the other. And so I commit to a career or you because I want to learn about myself. I want to grow. I want to develop and I want to discipline myself to know yeah. when my mind is playing tricks on me. Otherwise, I'm always going to be chasing uh, uh, the mind Something. tricks that are constantly happening. Yeah. 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 So, that leads so to if we jump. So, yeah. And so yeah. if we jump further down this path, right, and you've gone through this phase, you've, you know, dealt with the the drugs of early dating and you found someone you're going, okay, like I, I am, I'm in the commitment stage. Um, what I would love to hear from you is what are like a few of the things that you've noticed? Like, let's say, I don't know, three is a nice number, but it doesn't have to be three, but like, what are a few things you've noticed that someone who says, okay, I'm in a committed relationship. I want, this is the person for me. I want to spend my life with this person. What are a few things that you see are like staples in creating a long lasting, um, loving relationship. Well, I've said this all along, but in the last book in each other's care, this yeah. I focused on almost exclusively. It's a book yeah. divided by complaints that I've heard in my clinic over the years. And, uh, and this was written during COVID, uh, where I saw the, uh, a big, big problem that kept arising everywhere. Uh, and that is um, couples are a union, an alliance, the same as any union in a free society with free people coming together based on terms and conditions, not emotion. Therefore, you and I are going to create an alliance. We're going to be a team. Yeah. Therefore, we set up a bunch of social contracts that protect us from each other because human primates are unreliable animals. We are selfish and self-centered and opportunistic yeah. and moody and fickle and aggressive um, and xenophobic and racist. We're all these things, and yet we don't plan on those things as we would in a business partnership or in a right. dance troupe or anything where we want to win or we want to yeah. survive or we want to make money, right? We wouldn't do that. Um, but in love relationships, the only union that goes in without a structure, we do that, and that is uh, perilous. It's going to, uh, it's going to predict uh, a, a relationship that isn't going to last, because we have to have a structure that you and I co-create from scratch. We are creating this thing called a relationship, which actually doesn't exist except in our minds. <laughs> it's a mythology, Fair. so. So that's the beauty of our species. We're the only species that can make up things that don't exist. So a relationship yeah. is one. But we have to make sure we're making up the same thing. Otherwise, we're going to fight. We're going to get into trouble. So yeah. first and foremost, why are we? What's the point of us other than feeling an emotion? Because that will come and go. What's our purpose? What are we going to do mm. for each other that we couldn't pay somebody to do? Um, um, what is so special about us going forward? Well, it should be at the very bottom, we ensure each other's survival, right? Um, we're going to protect yeah. each other from each other and, and the environment because we live in a dangerous uh, world, always have been, always will. And so, so we co-create like, a, 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 like we're shaping a, a block of clay together. We're co-creating... Yeah what our relationship should be according to us, nobody else. What our relationship ethics should be according to us, nobody else. What our culture yeah. has to be our hmm. culture, not our parents or our grandparents' culture or the church or the temple. It's yeah. us, yeah. right? And that is something most people don't do because they don't think they should. They think, oh, uh, the, you just get married and love will will out and it'll work itself out. Yeah. We'll deal with it when we get there. <laughs> um, in no other world do we do that except love relationships. Yeah, so so um, make sure that the two of you start to look ahead at what could go wrong, plan for your devils, not your angels, um, and how are you going to do business? Not 
you don't go into a relationship to change who you are or your partner, but you are going to have to work on how we're going to do business as two separate individuals who are, like I said, irritating, annoying, and disappointing. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's just a fact. How are we going to work together so that we don't uh, we don't start a war in our own foxhole, right? Which is suicide. We don't. We're an alliance, not adversaries. We can't afford to be. So what are we, why are we, and, and where are we going, and do we agree? Mm. Now, there are such a thing as deal breakers, and a deal breaker is, if you really looked at it, we can't be together. Um, I want to have a child. I always want to have a child. You hate children, and yeah. here's, the human yeah. here's what happens in the human condition with the, with the attachment biology. We look at each other. We see the abyss that is uh, that is the end of our relationship because it's a non it's non negotiable, and then we buy a house together. That's what we do. We kick the can down the road, and it becomes a cancer that eventually gets us because a deal breaker is a deal breaker. Yeah. So yeah. what do people do? They have to take it off the table if they can. Um, you want to get married? I never want to get married. Right. I want to live in yeah. the country, yeah. hit the city. Um, you hate uh, the country and you have to be in the city. So, right. So th this yeah. first, um, you want polyamory. I want monogamy. Neither of us are wrong, but we can't work together. It won't work. Yeah. So that's what people have to do um, and sober up doing it because the future is at stake. This is not about law. This is about purpose. This is about deal yeah. or no deal. And uh, that's the major thing. That's one okay. major thing. The other major thing is... So this one, before you move to the next one, just to clarify, the yeah. first one is sitting down, why are we? Like, why are we in this together? Yeah. What are we yeah. in this for? Do we, do we, what do we want from this? Do we agree on it, more or less? Yeah, yeah. And it's got to cool. be the best thing. Uh, we're, we're getting each other on board and with thumbs up, deal, deal, deal. I'm not doing this because you want it and I'm afraid yeah. I'll lose it. Don't do that. We both want it. We both want it. And you have to make sure that I do. You can't afford for me to just say, I'll do it because you want and I want to get married or I want to be with you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That is going to hurt you as much as it's going to hurt me. Yeah. So if you're smart, you're going to say, nope. Convince me why you want this for yourself. Otherwise, no deal, because I'll pay for that. <laughs> yeah. That's the way to do it. And it takes courage it takes discipline yeah. and it takes being able to uh to do the right thing and the best thing for yourself even though it could be the hardest thing to do okay all right so that's number one the next one you were saying the manner in which you and i will interact when one or both of us is under stress this hmm. is what causes most trouble in the human primate world first one is why are we doing this if you and I don't have a shared purpose and a shared vision, um, we're going to act badly because there's no reason for us to be on board, right? Yeah. We'll start to uh, have civil war because we don't, we're not, uh, we're not focused on where we are the same and where we agree. We start to become overly focused on where we're different and where we disagree. That's war. Yeah. So structure, really important purpose, shared vision, all of that, really important. The other is, we have to operate as a two-person psychological system of we and us. We're still, we are still individuals, autonomous, two generals, shared power, shared authority, two bosses, two executives, right? Yeah. Two leaders. Therefore, we have to work collaboratively and cooperatively and respectfully. Otherwise, we go to war. Again, we're warlike creatures. This is very easy for us because of our survival instinct. So we have to play fair, just, and mutually sensitive to each other, or we start to accrue memory that gets interpreted as threat. And this, mm. if we're not careful, begins to, uh, begins to amount and grow and become inflamed. And this will lead to our demise, right? This will lead to our demise. We're no longer uh, advocates of each other. We're no longer friendly. Now we're adversaries. Uh, very easy to do in the human world. So, yeah. so again, we have to understand uh, how our mind works, how the brain works, and we have to do it right. Otherwise, we will fight. Um, 
and everybody will on the planet. Everybody will do the same thing under under these conditions and this kind of interaction uh, yeah. that leads yeah. to war. Right? We do it very, and, very easily. And so this is un, it, so it's sort of two part. It seems one, it's understanding again. You said how your partner reacts when they're under stress. So this is again part of your work. You talk even when you're dating, when you're in a relationship, you're sort of a detective learning about your your partner the person you're with so one it's yeah. okay when they stress out becoming aware of what are the things they do and i'm curious is a second part of this a big another big part of your work which is attachment style right there's these different um attachment styles we have that i'm going to assume determine how we act when we're under stress in a, in a part of the way yes absolutely so so attachment is uh is is a uh, a developmental theory that starts in infancy, um, and it is a subjective felt sense of safety and security by that infant, child, adolescent, adult, right? How uh, secure, insecure I feel or safe I feel with a primary attachment figure upon whom I am depending in some way. Now, yeah. if I get, uh, if I, uh, from the start, feel insecure or less than secure with my primaries in childhood, I'm going to adapt to the culture I'm in, to the environment I was born into, and that adaptation is going to uh, cause me to surrender either my autonomy or my need for dependency, either one or the mm. other, because of how my parent or parents are oriented based on how they were oriented because this we know right. is multi-generational it's it's nature it's not pathology it is uh it is natural um everyone uh, must adapt to the environment they're born into they don't get a choice so if i'm insecure on the clinging side that means that i was discouraged from going out in the world and explore the non-caregiver world Something in the environment caused me to cling to that caregiver. Often mm -hmm. it's the caregiver's need for me to be dependent and small and young and loving, uh, right, and cute, right? So that need is now being filled for the parents, not my, as child, not my needs. So right. I'm giving up something for that in order to feel secure. That's a ripoff. I'm now behaving in ways that keep me secure because my parent is treating me in an insecure fashion. Therefore, when I grow up, I start to feel angsty, angry, resentful already about the unfairness of my childhood, about what happens when I, when I depend on somebody. They abandon me. They get angry and punish me. They reject me. They no longer love me. I, I'm not special anymore. And so I'm constantly um, checking to see, do you love me? Do you love me? I'm, I'm wanting yeah. it to be proven to me. I become very difficult to deal with. And my protections to keep me from getting hurt again are interpreted as threatening to the other person. Therefore, they're more likely than not to do exactly what I have come to expect. I'm going to feel rejected. It's going to amplify this, right? Uh, yeah. That's because I'm behaving in a way that that the other person doesn't understand and feels off-putting, aggressive, unfriendly, frightening, scary, uh, whatever. Um, and that's unfair, right? But I don't know I'm doing yeah. it or I yeah. don't care because I'm too afraid. If I'm on the distancing side, um, uh, the distancing side of insecure, I had to give and up quick, my need to, quick, de to depend. Oh, go ahead. Quick part in there too, to, to keep it so that I think people would digest it in a way in, in the terms that you explain this, the person you just talked about would be a wave, correct? A wave, a wave. We call them waves. So wave in, is in the, someone, yeah. yeah, they move in, they move out. Um, and then the next person you're going to is what we'd call an island, correct? An island. The names have changed okay. to protect the innocent because the actual terms are clinical. Okay. They're, they're research based. It's the science and they're not, they're not fuzzy. So island okay. anchor wave, it's nautical. Yeah. It's friendly. <laughs> um, yeah. so this one's the island. The island is organized in such a way that they, uh, their family culture was based on performance and appearances. The self was more important, um, than the relationship. 
And therefore, um, I am organized around distancing, ab about around having to be independent because dependency was frowned on. So therefore, I look really good. I have given up my dependency needs. I don't even remember them anymore. And yeah. I look autonomous, but I'm actually quite anxious because I have to take care of myself. I can't be needy. I can't mm. call out. I can't signal for help. That's frowned upon. We don't do that here. That's implied. And now I'm that person. So I grow up being afraid that if I depend on you or when I do depend on you, I remember what happens. I lose my autonomy. I lose my independence. I lose my stuff. You co-opt everything. I'm a tool. And yeah. that uh, that creates a problem because the way I will protect myself is absolutely threatening to you. Um, I like it when you go away. I don't want to spend a lot of time with you. I'm no longer that into you. I don't know why, but I think it's you. Um, I, um, I, I, I love my alone time. I don't like being interrupted. I don't like, uh, I don't like you needing or demanding anything from me, right? Mm. Uh, because I'm afraid I don't know how to engage with you without losing myself and losing my independence as I think it is. It's actually a neglect, uh, but I don't realize it. Mm. And so I'm threatening, which causes you to act in ways that makes me more threatened naturally because I am I'm constantly triggering your insecurity. Yeah. Right. So this yeah. is the reason it's good to know not to bat each other or yourself over the head. This is simply a fluid adaptation based on memory of what happened. It can change through life. Um, it's not like personality. But yeah. if you don't understand yourself, you're going to do bad things to your partner and they're going to respond in ways that you'll go, oh, yeah, I know this. But you're causing yeah. it yeah. or at least you're you're instigating it. Um, right. Also, if your partner is doing this um, and you don't understand, your behavior is going to drive them further into it rather than help them out of it. And so this is why we want to understand this, not not to label and to categorize them as others, because right. we're, we're, all of us are this way. It's just that the people yeah. who are highly insecure, the people that are actually waves and islands are one trick ponies. That's all they do. They cannot do anything else. They are so, uh, they are so rigidified in their fear that it's constant. Whereas secures can be wavish or islandish, but they're not, uh, they're not stuck in one or the other. Okay. So that's big. They, in you, a nutshell, that's all that is. Yeah, and can you explain anchor um, a little bit as well? An anchor is someone who, let's say I'm an anchor, I grew up in a family that put relationship first, not the self. Therefore, the, uh, the, the, uh, the family culture was relationship-centered. I had my, my caregiver's attention. I had their patience. I could cling, I could distance, and I wasn't, there were no consequences for either of them. My parents hmm. didn't have a need for me to support their ego, their self-esteem, right. or yeah. the need for them to be regulated by me. Therefore, um, I am freed to develop and to discover myself. Uh, the parent um, is uh, available, and there's, and here's another thing, in early childhood, the first 18 months, I get a lot of skin-to-skin, -skin, face to face, eye-to-eye, -eye, continuous contact, hmm. which is essential for the building, uh, the structures in the brain that are essential for social emotional intelligence. Hmm. Uh, and so uh, there's that as well. So yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying something that, that actually has a lot of moving parts and complicated, but, um, but basically uh, people should not be discouraged by this because it's simply an adaptation based on memory and expectation because nothing else has happened to change my view. That's all. Yeah. Um, so it's really allowing you to under, like just gain awareness, right? Understand what is this person like? What are their needs, right? What are the maybe ways that they'll react when they're under stress? And when you understand those things, you can create this stronger yes. sort of social contract, this agreement with your partner um, that allows you to have a, a loving, lasting relationship. Yes. Here's the only caveat. If you come <laughs> across somebody who is a dyed in wool card carrying island, they have no awareness that they are, and um, um, or they do, but they don't care that they are, walk away. Because that person is not going to be workable in the system I'm talking about, which is secure mm. functioning. Uh, an okay. equal and fair 
relationship of uh, of people that have the same things to gain and lose and therefore are forced to the table because their fates are tied. This person is a solo yeah. player and doesn't mind it and thinks you're the problem and um, they're not ready for prime time. Same with a wave. Uh, the wave who doesn't know they're a wave or does but doesn't care mm -hmm. uh, is not in a, in a position to uh, to work with you. Um, it's, you're going to, yeah, they're too rigid and they're too set in their ways, um, or they're not in enough pain to question themselves so that you walk away hmm. from that. Okay. Good to know. Well, uh, Stan, this has been, you, your, your mind is incredible. Um, in, well, in everything that you're talking about. And, um, I feel like we should be you, here. You should, you should see all the areas that I'm really a moron in because I am. <laughs> But in this, in we won't talk area. about that today. <laughs> yeah. Well, no. I mean, truly, truly brilliant, though. Um, and I'm, I'm so <laughs> grateful for everything you've shared thus far. And I feel like we could be here for. We're joking around about it earlier, but we could be here for another four hours. Um, you know, just continuing to bring things. Maybe we'll do it again. Um, I yes. think that could be fun. Yeah. But I'm curious for for our listener that's you know heard everything you said and just been like, man, Stan is speaking my language. I need more of what Stan's talking about. Um, you have many books out and I know you have a new book out as well. And I'm curious if people want to get more of just you and everything you do and, and your, your, your life work, um, where's the best place they can find you, get to know you more and, and dive into everything that you do. Well, you can go to, uh, the pact institute.com, the P A C T institute.com. Mm -hmm. If you're a clinician or in the mental health field, we train clinicians. That's how we started uh, all over the world. Um, it is quite a complex approach. It's a polytheoretical <laughs> poly yeah. poly theoretical approach. But if you like, uh, you know, jazz, you'll like this approach. Um, if you are a couple uh, and you're interested in our workshops, we uh, do them throughout the year. My wife and I run them. Mm. We also do couple retreats abroad. We're going to do one in Portugal. These are luxury retreats. We did one in Spain last year. Amazing. Um, sign up for that. That's next year in Portugal. And you can find that information at that site. Okay, perfect. Oh, Amazing. And, and in social yes. media, uh, it's always at Dr. Stan Tankin. Okay, perfect. All right. We'll put okay. all that in the show notes. So it's super easy for everyone to find and hang out with you. So um, hopefully some people will come your way and hang out with you across the country or um, you know, wherever, wherever you go after that. And my last question for you um, is a question we ask to all of our guests because we want to help our listener find direction, but we also believe in doing it through action. And yeah. that's, you know, if you could give our listener one thing to do in the next 24 to 48 hours to start finding direction, um, what would that be? And maybe we even put a spin on it and say, you know, if they could do one thing in the next 24 hours to find direction in their relationship, what would that be? That would be actually uh, looking to see where you're going and check your purpose and see if your partner is on the same page. We mm. operate by purpose. If we live by feeling and emotion, our relationship will, our lives will be a roller coaster like emotions and, and, and feelings are. Therefore, we have to raise the bar and set yeah. uh, a sense of purpose to do the right thing, the best thing, or what is good, um, even though it may be the hardest thing to do. Mm -hmm. That is the only thing that makes our life awesome and from, uh, from mm -hmm. being a roller coaster or just rudderless. So purpose, intention. Amazing. Well, Stan, yeah. um, thank you again so much for being here, Dr. Taffy. Thank it's you. It's been an honor. Thank it's you. been a privilege. And um, <laughs> and and I, I really would love to have a, a further conversation. I think we could go 10 times further than this. So um, thank you for everything you do. It, for all our listeners, make sure you pick up one or multiple of Stan's books because um, they will they will enrich your life in an incredible way. So um, Stan, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Congratulations, my friend, on crushing it through another episode here on Finding Direction. Make sure you give yourself a pat on the back, a round of applause, because you are one of the few who is not willing to settle for less than a life that lights up your soul and that is absolutely something worth celebrating. I want to say thank you, as always, for joining me on this week's episode. I hope you got something from Dr. Tatkin, and more importantly, I hope you take some of it and as always, start implementing it into your life, right? That's how you start to see the change. You got to take the things and start 
building them into your life. If you have not already, I want to encourage you to make sure you hit that subscribe button so you can join us every single week on this show. And other than that, that's all we got for you today. Have a wonderful, beautiful, outstanding, incredible rest of your day. And I will talk to you on the podcast soon, my friend. Take care.